this autumn on two, the spread of Western civilization is charted in The Triumph of the West, a controversial view of history presented by John Roberts. Western technology offers new aspirations, a new sense of the possible. India's Nobel Prize winners, her tracking stations and laboratories, imply a way of looking at the world, at the cosmos, which is totally at variance with that of India's hundreds of millions whose lives are still dominated by tradition. The psychological effects of those hopes and expectations have to be added to all the other forces flowing from the West which have played upon India. Those forces are great breakers down of established ways, great stirrers up of society, and not just here in India. All around the world now, in developing nations, men are trying to enlist them in the search for wealth. The Triumph of the West, this autumn on BBC Two. And now on to, we join Chris Searle as he presents some golden moments from BBC television programmes in Winterville. Hello. I'm in a really dull-looking building on an industrial estate in West London. I'm surrounded by hundreds of thousands of really dull-looking cans and boxes, but inside them, there's a very special kind of magic. This is the BBC's film and videotape archive in Windmill Road. And in these cans, there are millions of feet, some of the most golden moments from television, going back as far as the beginning of TV in 1936. In our brand new series called Windmill, we're going to be showing some of these golden moments, some of them for the first time since they were broadcast. Windmill will be a series later in the year, but just to turn things round, we're starting our windmill, um, windmilling with a holiday special, and very special it is too. We'll be sitting back in a nice comfy deck chair, relaxing and reliving some golden holiday moments. We'll stop off at Faulty Towers. Good morning, madam. Can I help you? Are you the manager? I am the owner, madam. We'll find out why holiday weather is so often so bad. The temperature has fallen in Scotland quite markedly, enough to give showers of snow in some places. We'll meet Ruth Maddock and the holiday camps of the 50s. Hi, dee hi! Hi, dee <laughs> And the holiday camps of the 40s. <laughs> We'll even find out where Muffin the Mule took a case full of carrots. We want Muffin, everybody sing. We want Muffin the Mule. Hello, everyone. What you really want on holiday is to relax, sit back in a nice comfy deck chair, and enjoy your own perfect bit of beach. The trouble is, these things don't come with instructions. People, I suppose, must end up spending their holidays standing up. Anyway, I think that's quite enough deck chairs. In 1949, all television came from the top of a hill in North London. 
Alexandra Palace, with its spiky aerial stuck on top, became for a while one of the country's most famous landmarks. And the broadcasters and engineers in those early days of TV were keen as mustard to try out new ideas. On a bank holiday, for example, when everybody's gone off to the seaside, what happens in London? Well, a small but intrepid team from the BBC set off to find out, and a nicer bunch of chaps you couldn't ask to meet. Well, good evening, or perhaps I should say good morning, because the time is now 8.30 on this rather overcast, blustery August bank holiday morning. We're standing at the moment on the terrace of Alexandra Palace here, overlooking the vast panorama of London stretching out before us, and Philip Doughty and Monty Redknapp and I thought w that we'd take you down into London and let you see what the, what's going on down there on this August bank holiday. We haven't prepared any script. Uh, we're at the moment discussing a list of places that we thought we'd take you to. But the first one on the list is Victoria Station, where we'll be reporting to you again in about half an hour's time. We'll return to Monty and the boys in their half-timbered car in about half an hour's time. When you go on holiday, it's always nicer to take a friend, as John Noakes discovered. Uh, one return to Skegness, please, and one single tortoise. One single tortoise. One single tortoise. Uh, I'm coming back tomorrow, but the tortoise is staying. One of the things which give a clear feeling of time is changing fashions in clothes. Look at this picture post from 1949, for example. The hairdo and the skirt are very late 40s, but what about the top? I'd never have guessed that the boob tube was unve unveiled in 1949. Only in those days, it was called the stocking top. The other thing which really pinpoints time is the shape of cars. One film from the television archives takes us right back to a time when there were very few cars around. One reason was that just after the war, you couldn't get petrol. Well, you could, but only in small quantities. Everybody had rations. Every time you bought petrol, the petrol pump attendant snipped out some of these. And when your book was empty, no more petrol. But on May the 26th, 1950, rationing ended. And a week later, on the Whitson Bank holiday, motorists went mad with pleasure. Faithful old cars were polished up and brought out for a trip to the seaside. Now, we've put together a very evocative set of images from the Whitson holiday, 1950, with the music of Cliff Richard. Now, he was only nine at the time, so he hadn't quite made his first record. But his music fits the mood of this film perfectly. <laughs> for a week or two fun and laughter on a summer holiday no more worries for me or you for a week or two we're going where the sun shines brightly we're going where the sea is blue we've seen it in the movies 
Now let's see if it's true Everybody has a summer holiday Doing things they always wanted to So we're going on a summer holiday To make our dreams come true For me and you However you get there, when you do get there, you've got to find somewhere to stay. And for a lot of people, that means a cosy, welcoming hotel. And that's exactly what you won't find in our comedy classic. Faulty Towers is a perfectly good hotel. It's the owner, the beastly Basil Faulty, who makes a visit there feel like a week in a detention centre. But when one guest, the completely unpleasant Mrs Richards, came to stay and asked to see the manager, you had a feeling, just for a moment, that Basil had met his match. Good morning, madam. Can I help you? Are you the manager? I am the owner, madam. What? I am the owner. I want to speak to the manager. I am the manager too. What? I am the manager as well. Manager, him manager. <laughs> You're what? I'm the manager. What? I'm the manager. Yes, I know. You've just told me. What's the matter with you? Now listen to me. I booked a room with a bath. When I book a room with a bath, I expect to get a bath. You've got a bath. I'm not paying seven pounds twenty pence per night plus VAT for a room without there a bath. Where is your bath? You call that a bath? It's not big enough to drown a mouse. It's disgraceful. I wish you were a mouse on your And another thing. I asked for a room with a view. Deaf, mad and blind. Uh, this is the view as far as I can remember, madam. Yes, yes, this is it. When I pay for a view, I expect something more interesting than that. But that is Torquay, madam. No, it's not good enough. Well, may I ask what you were expecting to see out of a talky hotel bedroom window? <laughs> Sydney Opera House, perhaps? The hanging gardens of Babylon? Herds of wildebeest sweeping majestically? I, I expect to be able to see the sea. You can see the sea. It's over there between the land and the sky. I need a telescope to see that. Well, may I suggest that you consider moving to a hotel closer to the sea? Or preferably in it. Right. <laughs> Now, listen to me. I'm not satisfied, but I've decided to stay here. However, I shall expect a reduction. Why? Because Krakatoa's not erupting at the moment? Or? <laughs> because the room is cold, the bath is too small, the view is invisible, and the radio doesn't work. No, the radio works. You go. What? <laughs> I'll see if I can fix it, you scabby old bastard. <laughs> I think we got something there. What? I think we got something, then. What are you doing? Huh? <laughs> I don't, don't think me rude, but may I ask, do you by any chance have a hearing aid? A what? A hearing aid! Yes, I do have a hearing aid. Would you like me to get it mended? Mended? <laughs> it's working perfectly all right. No, it isn't. I haven't got it turned on at the moment. Why not? The battery runs down. <laughs> now, what sort of a reduction are you going to give me on this room? 60% if you turn it on. What? My wife handles all such matters. I'm sure she will be delighted to discuss it with you. I shall speak to her after lunch. You heard that all right, didn't you? What? <laughs> Thank you so much. A lunch will be served at half past 12. <laughs> well, quiet family seaside hotels can get a bit noisy, obviously. But if you really want to get away from it all, think your own thoughts, and have a couple of weeks daydreaming in the sun, where better than a quiet fishing village? on the shores of the azure mediterranean what do you get peace perfect peace <laughs> The main purpose of a package to the Mediterranean is a super suntan to dazzle your friends with. 
And for the sun-starved British, that means generous dollops of sun oil. And here's where the film takes a bit of a liberty. It's quite clear they've added their own sound effects. If you listen carefully, you'll hear what a sound engineer produced with a microphone like this long after the film was made. Listen. Like that. It's a bit cheeky, but it makes a point. Wasn't me, honest. I wonder how Monty and the boys in their wooden car are getting on. We're in Victoria Station now, and as you can see from the clock, it's taken us about an hour to get here into the under the clock and onto the platform. We only took half an hour as we expected to arrive here, but it's taken us half an hour to fight our way in amongst the crowds. Well now, excuse me, sir, would, would you mind coming in and just telling us where you're going just for a moment? I know I mustn't keep you because you've got a train to catch, haven't you? Oh, we're going to Brighton. We're going to Brighton, are you? Yes. Well, what, what's your name? Do you mind giving uh, it? Well, Thomas Bassett. Thomas Bassett, and uh, what's the little, little boy here? David. Hello, David. Hello. And um, do you always go to Brighton on August Bank holiday? Well, I've been two or three times, but first time in West I see. Never been before. You've never been before, no, have you? I've never been before. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, wait, when you get there, what do you reckon you're going to do today? Well, we haven't decided. I'm going for a swim anyway. Are you? <laughs> Taking a baby in the well, it's, it's not too warm, I'm afraid, but still, uh, well, I think it's all right. we hope the weather keeps fine for you. So as that family go off to Brighton, here are people going off to other stations on the south coast for their holiday, to Bexhill, Eastbourne and Hastings and other places. They seem to be more interested in our television cameras at the moment. I hope they won't miss their trains in consequence. Now, are you ready for this? It's quiz time! Thank you, thank you, bless you, yes, right, thank you, thank you. I always wanted to do that. Yes, it's time to pitch your wits, take your yeses, pick your nose, and chance your arm in our wistful trip along memory corner. All you have to do is name the famous person going on their holes. Here they come right now. We'll start with an easyish one. Who is this lady going off with her hubby in her nice big car? Got it yet? It's yes, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in disguise. Now, that was a bit easy. Try this one. Who are these two famous sons of a famous dad setting off for a holiday in their car? Oops, there they go, driving into the owners. All right. Who are they? Have you got it yet? Here they come now. The answer is the Dimbleby brothers, David and Jonathan. Even as teenagers, they knew how to look wonderful in front of a camera, did they not? Now, don't blink. Here's a quick-fire collection of fantastically famous faces from the past. All you have to do is to name them. Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away. If you can use some exotic booze, there's a bar in far Bombay. Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away. Come fly with me, let's float down to Peru. In Llama Land, there's a one-man band, and he'll toot his flute for you. Come fly with me, let's take off in the blue. Well, how did you get on? Now's your chance to find out. The names behind the faces are... Singer Rolf Harris, Sandy Shaw, her with the bare feet, remember, and Adam Faith. Film stars Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. Now, here's a tricky one. Model Patty Boyd with her husband, Beetle George Harrison. As footballer, Georgie Best. Italian film star Sophia Loren and her film producer husband, Carlo Ponti. Prime Minister, yachtsman and conductor, Edward Heath. There's Princess Margaret just coming home from a holiday in Ireland. 
Prime Minister James Callaghan. That is singer Bob Dylan, with a girl he wrote a song about, Sarah. And lastly, and far from leastly, some of the rock band, the Rolling Stones. There's Brian Jones on the far left, Bill Wyman, behind him, Charlie Watts, and on the right, old rubber lips himself, Mick Jagger. Well, that's all for Windmill Quiz Time for another week. Join us down memory lane next time we're down it. Bye! <laughs>
starts with childhood, really. You, you go to fairs and you get keen on them, and uh, it really stays with you for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. What takes the longest time? Is it the making the components or painting them, or what? Well, it's all fairly time-consuming. The painting, of course, takes considerable time if you go into the sufficient detail on it. And they are authentic. I mean, they're, as you said, they're, they're authentic copies of real fairgrounds. Yeah, they are, copy, right. they are copies of actual fairgrounds. So there really was a Ben-Hur uh, like this with, with yes. the chariot on the front. And yes, And exactly. that's all painted by hand, is it? Yeah, they're all um, oil colours. Amazing, amazing. And can you take things, uh, can you look inside them? I mean, are they, are they they're yes. made inside as well? I can demonstrate that on this one. I'll just stop it. Turn out the lights. And the panels, a hey, presto, they all come apart. Steps. It's coming apart in bits that look like the bits that, that you, I've seen on lorries on the way to fairgrounds. Yes, that's so. We, we make them in uh, the exact number of parts to the real, real fairground model. And uh, a lot of modelers build the transport and pack the things and Do the, play about with them in general. No, no, no. Have you ever made a model of a cannon that fires a human? No, I can't say that I have. Well, watch this. There really are people who work as human cannonballs, believe it or not. Paul Heine went to meet one of the people the owner somehow manages to persuade to be fired from his cannon twice a day and three times on bank holidays. What's it like in the tube? What's going through Sue's mind as she gets in, do you think? Um, panic, I should think. And uh, it's very, very frightening down the bottom because the hole at the top looks tiny and you can't imagine that you'd ever fit out of it. And it's quite hot in there, very claustrophobic. And you can smell old gunpowder. <laughs> uh, not very pleasant at all, really. Come on, Sue, hurry up now. The fuse is burning out. Go on, down you go. Right, are you ready? Yes. Right, she's ready then, ladies and gentlemen. It's three, two, one, fire! And what's it like when the moment it, it goes? Um, a very, very loud bang and it feels as though your body's had the biggest jolt to its life and then the next thing you know you're flying through the air and you're looking for the net and trying to do some assault and land properly it all happens very very quickly which is the only good thing about it really it's over quickly it's something that you don't really ever get used to would you like to be fired from a cannon Vic? well i've been fired a couple of times but never from a cannon <laughs> Okay, <laughs> not from a cannon. Well, here's another fairground stunt I think you're going to like. J.C. Diamond, the incredible escapologist and ex-milkman, is chained up by volunteers from the police force, then locked into a blue sack, and then left on the ground directly in the path of 15 tons of... Well, see for yourself. You sure you know what you're doing? <laughs> this is the worst part, waiting till I can move. Far corner. Be prepared, if necessary, to stand back if anything happens when the steamroller is approaching. And we're on our marks. Get set. Go. Here comes Fred and Malcolm. JC now is fighting hard to get out of all these restraints. He's got a big task on there. Can he do it? He's still got some time. They're coming at a great speed here now. He's getting very close. JC, can he get out? Is he going to make it? Is he going to be? He's done it! Oh, he's done it! Just as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand. How was it? How was it? Well, it was pretty hard work. It was. I've made it again. It looked hellish close. Well, I could hear him thundering towards me, and I did it. You can hear the rumbling, can Oh, yes. Yes, the ground moves. Tremendous. Listen, thank you very much for bringing these marvellous models with you, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Chris. Well, there's one big problem for fairground operators in this country. Unpredictable British weather. When it rains, it's very bad for business. But there's one consolation for us. The mood of a rain-sodden fairground can make a stunning subject for a film.
least the Whitten August Bank Holiday Mondays are the days which make or break the showman. And if it rains in the show business, is no business. The show business is no business when it rains, that's what he said. Every holiday in this country means a gamble with the weather. Will it rain or will it be a scorcher? The people who are closest to knowing are the weather forecasters, and they're the stars of our windmill inside view behind the scenes of the television business. Our guide to the risky business of predicting the unpredictable is forecaster Ian McCaskill. A warm welcome to you, Ian. Hi, Chris. Don't you get fed up with people blaming you when the weather's bad? It's all your fault. Well, it is my fault. It's part of the job. We are specially bred for our thick skins. Right. Yeah. How accurate are TV forecasts, really? All right. Uh, independents of judgments have shown about 85 out of 100 are helpful. And don't ask about the other 15. <laughs> well, I want to ask about the other 15 because it seems a bit unfair on you. Why is British weather so relatively unpredictable? It's easy to predict. Predicting it right, that's the hard bit. <laughs> that's the trick. Well, why is it? Because most of our weather comes from the Atlantic, and in spite of computers, in spite of satellites, we still don't know exactly what's out there, and that's the trouble. You blame the Atlantic Ocean? Absolutely. Will you promise me faithfully that in among those computers and gadgets you've got at the Weather Centre, you haven't got a secret piece of seaweed hanging up somewhere? Seaweed? <laughs> I do have a fur cone in the car. Have you? Yes, I have, yeah. And does it work? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Of course it doesn't. Well, all those computers are still a relatively new idea. People used to use things like seaweed to forecast the weather. And we found some film of Tony Soper with a huge piece of wonderfully slimy weed down by the seashore. They're splendid things. They're all plants, just like land plants, but they get their nourishment from the sea. They don't have any roots. They have a, a hold fast, holding them tight to the stone at the bottom there so that they don't get washed away. This one's uh, a laminaria, saccharina. It's got a sugary taste when it's dry. It's got a sort of sugar alcohol on the surface, and it does taste quite sweet, but uh, most people know this one as a weather forecaster like all these seaweeds, it's hygroscopic, it attracts water uh, so that if it's dry, if the atmosphere is dry, the seaweed is dry, but if there's any humidity about, it starts to get a bit slack and damp. The only snag is, of course, it tells you when it's raining, not when it's going to rain. So, Tony Soper doesn't hold with it as a forecaster and neither do you. What about the other old wives' tales, like Red Sky at Night, Shepherd's Delight, and um, Swallows Fly High, It'll Be Dry? Do those have any meaning at all? Well, I think Swallows are as stupid as me. They're up there because it is dry, and that's where the insects are. Like now, seaweed, really. That's right. Now, Red Sky at Night, this was mentioned in the Bible, in uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 16, in the old St. James Version. Jesus said the Red Sky at Night was a good one, he said. Really? Or what's that effect? What about the official forecaster's view? There are good scientific reasons why this is so. Yes? Really? The Absolutely. Red sky, red sky at night means red sky dry in the morning. In the morning. Red sky in the morning means rubbish. I've got another wonderful old wives' tale for you, an old, old one. We found a film of a wonderful old machine which tells you what the weather's definitely going to do. It's Professor Noel Dilley's favourite, and quite apart from what makes it work, which you'll see in a moment, I think you're going to like its name. Dr. Merriweather's Animal Electricity Tempest Prognosticator. Back in 1851, Dr. Merriweather hit on the zany idea that if leeches were good for sucking blood and for curing people, then they ought to be able to predict the weather. The leeches climb the glass in bad weather, up to the top here, where they dislodge the stick, release the chain, and the bell rings. Does it work? Well, it's just possible that they do respond to changes in atmospheric pressure. But the Royal Meteorological Society didn't have much faith in leech responses. They rejected Dr. Merriweather's plans for a national leech network. A national leech network? That is a great idea. How about it, Ian? Well, it doesn't ring any bells for me. <laughs> could it help leeches? Any good? Well, well it could help, yes. We, we, we never turn away help, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ian is one of the latest in a long line of distinguished weathermen who've also become television celebrities. I wonder if you remember some of these faces. And for the other weather details, let's have a look at this chart over here, where you'll see in Scotland the showers and sunny intervals sort of weather 
and that will gradually sp spread southwards into some of these regions here. Um, looking fairly simple, high pressure over the Alps, a low pressure near Iceland, another cell of high pressure on the western side of the Atlantic. Well, this is today's chart, and one thing that we can reflect on as we look at it is to be glad that we're not out there in the middle of the Atlantic where we've got this very deep depression, 950 millibars, as deep as we've seen it for many a long day. But we're not to worry too much about it because it's moving northwards, it's filling all the while, and that's not going to affect our weather at all. These mild southwesterly winds mean springtime for us all. A lot of mild weather to come, but just like spring, these fronts mean rain at times as well. And the, with these fronts too, we'll bring quite a bit of rain over southern parts of Britain during the next 24 hours. Ian McCaskill and his socks. The names, by the way, were Peter Walker, Bert Ford, Jack Scott, and the last one, as you saw, in his socks. You don't really, Ian, do the weather forecast really in your do. socks. Well, you've yes, got to really take your yes, shoes yes. off now. Nowadays, I can afford socks with only one hole, <laughs> the one that the book goes in. In those days, a lot of the lines were drawn on the chart by hand, and later came the magnetic strips. That didn't end till this year, and you had to, used to have to do that, didn't we did. you? We did. We'd come in at 9 o'clock in the morning and start... Honestly, this, this is really sweaty, this, you know, start... Oh, goodness, my goodness, look at, look at, look at the time, you know. No. But it must have taken you ages at it all. Took, right? It took hours. And yeah, it had to be very complex. exact, I suppose, <laughs> well, <it>? Yes, <laughs> that was oh. the idea. Okay. <laughs> it, was, it was a bit sort of hit and miss, Mike, to say, well... Well, that's pretty speedy. That's pretty speedy. Well done. I sort of often suspected you of uh, throwing them on uh, well, yeah, we, this, this is part of the addition. This. Look at that. <laughs> right way up. And the right way up. Right. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, all that's changed now because since the beginning of this year, the television weather forecast has gone high tech with some pretty nifty computer programs to get weather pictures into people's homes. Bill Giles told the story of when it all started. To put me in the picture, we use a system known as colour separation overlay. Sounds posh, I know. But all that's needed is for me to stand in front of a blue screen and the electronics do the rest. I said a tropical island, not a traffic island. This is all very clever, but all I can still see is a plain blue screen. So for me to see what I have to point at for the forecast, we use a projector situated behind here. This is actually a projection screen, and we shine the weather pictures on the back so that I can actually see what I'm pointing at. Then if we switch on everything together, hey presto, now I can see the charts and so can you. But there's even more because when I look at the camera, I can see the completed picture right in front of the lens. It's exactly the same device used by the newsreaders, but instead of seeing words, I see exactly what you're seeing, that's providing I've cleaned my glasses. But also on the same picture is a countdown clock, which tells me when to stop talking. That's never an easy task, but it's better than a mallet or being cut off in the prime. Well, Ian McGaskill, uh, we have to cut you off in your prime, I'm sorry to say, but thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we'll, we'll be watching the weather with renewed interest from now on. Thank really? you. Well, here's another taste of the kind of wet bank holiday we can blame on poor Ian McGaskill. It's filmed entirely from a helicopter in a magical series called Bird's Eye View. The commentary is by the poet John Betjeman. All put your mechs on. Run for shelter fast, crouch where you like until it's fine again. Holiday cheerfulness is unsurpassed. Why be put out by healthy English rain? Are we downhearted? No, we're happy still. We came here to enjoy ourselves, and we will. Now, we invite you to join in and sing with us. Now, really let it go. Enjoy yourselves and sing heartily. Right away, please. What's true of Westerns, true of more than most, no every resort along the coast, when everybody's feeling safe and warm, unheralded arrives the summer storm. Those are the things the posters do not show. Those are the headaches of the PRO. Really open your mouth and sing, this is the best air in the British Isles. So come on, take advantage of it. The BBC Television Library in Windmill Road in West London is the biggest of its kind in the world. They've got millions of feet of film going right back to 1936, and now they've got miles and miles of video dating back to the early 60s. But that's nothing compared with another, much bigger archive, 
which is spread all over the country. I'm referring to the innumerable rolls and rolls of home movies shot on cameras like this. This is an old Pathé 9.5 millimeter camera. Wonderful old thing. Now, those sort of films are just seen a few times and then inevitably they end up in somebody's cupboard. And the BBC Library has kept a programme which was all old home movies from beginning to end, all from the 1920s and 30s. And they couldn't have chosen a better subject for this special edition of Windmill. You guessed it, holidays. When we come back with Windmill for our series in the autumn, we'd like to run more films from the great British home archive. If you've got some rolls of film sitting in a cupboard, and it doesn't have to be about holidays, of course, we'd love to see it. We'd particularly like films which have some special value, like unusual events, famous people, typical fashions of the time, funny old forms of transport, buildings, food, love and marriage, animals, or even just silly jokes. Old or recent, it doesn't matter. We leave the choice to you. Now, we'll take good care of them, but obviously we'll send them all back to you. Our address is Windmill, BBC Television, London, W12, 8QT. On holiday, you don't have to lie around on the beach if you don't want to. You can dig it up. A lot of people do, but there can't be many who take it as seriously as the man Philip Tibbenham found in Weymouth. Some people might say that at 65, Fred Darrington's become obsessed with what started off as a holiday pastime 50 years ago. These days, when the summer season starts, he packs up his job as a handyman in London. Then he heads for Weymouth and pitches his tent in the same spot on the front. Using just sand, seawater, a knife, a brush, and inexhaustible patience, he sets about his annual creation. This season, the theme just happens to be nursery rhymes. The old woman who lived in a shoe, Humpty Dumpty, that sort of thing. But it could be anything. When I do a, a full show like The Last Supper, that takes 14 days. But I reckon the normal full-size show down here through the summer is about five to seven days' work. And how do you get, get it to stay looking almost like concrete? I don't understand that. Well, it's simply the nature of the sand. It's a limestone sand. And if you can do that with a sand, you know it's possible to produce practically anything. And once that's wet, really wet, and then the, the water is dried off, drawn off gently with the, with the natural drainage of the sand, it almost reverts to a stone. When you've painted your sandcastle, why not try drawing a beautiful seascape? Tony Hart's a magician of a painter. Watch it happen before your very eyes. Thank you. 
Now, before you go on your holes, you've got to make the big decision. Where? For Albert Steptoe and son Harold, it had always been a simple choice. Bogner. But Harold, the young 37-year-old tearaway, suddenly decided to break with tradition and send off us some brochures. And then his dad got hold of them. The result is an episode in one of the finest and most beautifully produced comedy series where he starts. Like most weeks, Harold wants to get away from his dreadful old dad, and dad somehow manages to keep him in his place. The way he does it is by using the power of pathos, scheming sentimentality, and Harold falls for it every time. Now, we have a guest on Windmill today who really conjures up all the fun of the traditional British holiday camp. If you heard this on the loudspeaker outside your chalet, you'd know exactly who it is. Hello, campers. <laughs> Heidi, hi. Hi. <laughs> Right, from Heidi High, it's Gladys Pugh, also known as actress Ruth Maddock. Very warm welcome to you. Thank you. you. Right. From the look of that series, you'd think everybody spent all their lives on a holiday camp. It's very true to life. Now, what were your first experiences of a holiday camp? How many times had you been there before they made the programme? Oh, well, I'd only been once, actually. You know? And that was only for one day when I was a little girl. My parents couldn't afford to go for a whole week, so we went for one day to a holiday camp in filing. So when you came to make the series, you had to learn how to be a yellow coat from scratch, really? Indeed, we did. Um, all of us did. What happened was David Croft took us down to the holiday camp where we do all the filming, and he said, right, you stay here. And we had to stay for a whole week on the holiday camp while we did the pilot. Did, and uh, it was very good for us. Did Gladys Pugh turn out to be a good yellow coat? Oh, yes. Well, Gladys has worked her way up, you see, with Maplin's. I mean, Mr. Joel Mappin, he does appreciate what she's done. And, of course, Gladys is um, from the valleys, as you probably know, and she's really had to sort of fight her way to get out of the valleys because, remember, she was born probably just before the Second World War because we're talking about the end of the 50s. You see, it's not of this time, and this is what people tend to forget, all the youngsters watching. But quite ambitious, right. Gladys. She's an ambitious lady, our Glad, yes. Right, well, yes. We've, got a, we've got a wonderful moment from a programme in which that's really shown up. Joe Maplin, the mysterious owner, has written to the entertainment's manager, played by Simon Cadell, who Gladys Pugh adores. And he wrote the letter after doing a bit of spying on what the Yellowcoats were up to, and he refers to males as M's, and females as is thrilled by that. She's even given herself admiral stripes because she's now in charge. At last, her moment has come. This is <laughs> what a wonderful <laughs> flounce, my goodness. That's Poor right. old Gladys, you know, <laughs> she's pathetic, really. <laughs> what are your earliest memories of childhood holidays? Oh, well, my earliest memories were, of course, the seaside. Um, we used to go down to Swansea. I lived about four miles outside Swansea in those days. And we used to go to a place called the Bays. And the Bays was the Gower Peninsula. There's a picture of you, look. Yeah. Is that oh, the Bays? Yes. yes, that's probably Oxwich Bay, that one, I would think. And you dug that hole? Yes, and stood I did. in it. You were very proud of that. How old were you uh, then, yes, do you I know? I must be about five, probably, then. Yeah. Yes. Happy childhood holiday. Yes, so lovely, nice. lovely childhood. Where do you go now for your holidays? Well, I go abroad now because of the time I have to take it. We've got a snap of you. Abroad. Yes. There you are. Here are my friends. Where are you? As you can see, well, I'm right up there next to, to Dory Shane, actually. And there's Paul Shane there, and there's my husband and two other friends. And we all went on holiday together last year to the Algarve. And it was Smashing. glorious. Lovely. Mm. Well, we were looking at uh, the fiction of Heidi High just now. What about the fact? We found some actual film of a real holiday camp. It was produced back in 1948 when holiday camps had only just been invented. The windmill team has even managed to track down a record which features the campers at an early holiday camp. And what I didn't know till now was that they really did say, Heidi hi, Heidi ho. Heidi hi! Heidi ho! May we have a little shoot, please, campers? Thank you. Now, campers, here is your own Heidi hi song. Ready? <laughs> Heidi 
high, isn't that great? What are your earliest memories of television from a viewer's point of view? Well, I suppose the first one must have been the coronation. Um, everybody of our era remembers that. And then, of course, there was um, Muffin the Mule and Children's Hour, which I enjoyed very much. Was Muffin the Mule a favourite of yours? Oh, yes. I really right. believed that Muffin existed. Really? Yes, I had a very fertile <laughs> imagination. Mule. Well, I remember it very well as well. But this is going to take a lot of people back to their childhood. One of the few surviving recordings of Muffin the Mule. Don't forget, nearly everything was live in those days. It actually features Muffin setting off on his holidays. There you are. Look at his name. Isn't it grand? <laughs> so, you're going to France, over to France. I think that's a song. Are you ready? I've got the chance to France, over to France, to see my French relations and have some celebrations. to dance in the street like the Frenchmen do and over the bridge of Avignon wouldn't you I've got the chance to France over to France the thought of it can make me dance bravo Muffin Happy memories and the lovely voice of Annette Mills. Yeah, it's lovely, it wasn't takes she? you back, doesn't it? It's it extraordinary does. how evocative. Beautiful diction she had. Yes, lovely. didn't she? Mm. Well, thank you very much, Ruth, for joining us. Do you say Heidi Hi to say uh, goodbye as well as hello? Oh, yes. Heidi Hi, campers. Have a lovely summer holiday whenever you have it. Bye bye. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. The pity is it's time for us to say Heidi Hi as well. It's a shame that holidays ever have to end. When they do, they always leave you tired but happy whatever your age. Where do you want to go? Tell Nanny and I'll take you. Where do you want to go, Pet? Where do you want to go? Hey? Go home. Oh, it's time for me to go home too. Don't forget to send us the memorable moments from your home movies. And remember to include your name, address and telephone number if you have one. We'll take good care of your films and they may be in our series. From all the Windmill team till we meet again in October, goodbye. And here finally is a really happy section of the August Bank holiday crowd. afternoon to you, or rather, good night. Well, Ruth Maddock hops over to BBC One in a moment to say Heidi Hi. She presents the traditional August bank holiday edition of Disney Time. While here on two, Humphrey Bogart and Ava Gardner star in this evening's film, The Barefoot Contessa. <laughs>